In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through him, and without him was not anything made that was made. In him was life, and the life was the light of men. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. And the word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we have seen his glory, glory as of the only Son from the Father, full of grace and truth. Let's pray. Lord, we come to you now having sung songs about you and to you. We have prayed, we have given, some have come from small groups where they have studied your word. We're here to meet you. And and so I pray, God, that we would see you high and lifted up. I, I pray that you would speak through me. I pray that you would speak in spite of me, move me aside, speak around me, cause the people here to to hear your word, if nothing else, as we look today in the book of Luke. And I I just ask God that in just a bit when we leave this place, all of us, every single one of us would be more like you than we ever have been before. Lord, I, I pray for those who are here that do not know you yet as Lord and Savior. I pray that you would open their eyes. I, I pray that they would see you and understand their need for you. For those of us who do know you, remind us of who we are. Tie our hearts directly to yours so that our lives will be filled with your grace and your presence and your purpose for us. Lord, I, I pray for anyone who is here right now that is under a load. Um, it's a load of anxiety or stress or depression. Emotionally, they are wrung out and For whatever reason, they find themselves in that place, and they may not even know why they're in that place. I ask God that you would intervene, and that you would be the God of all peace, the God of all comfort, the God of all direction for them. There are those here today, Lord, who are under a load, and they do know why. Maybe they have received a diagnosis. Maybe uh, they have lost a job. Maybe their marriage is in trouble. Maybe they have a wayward child. Maybe their finances are struggling, and on and on and on the list goes. And so, Lord, I, I pray there also that you would intervene, that you would give direction, healing, purpose, comfort, provision, and that you would use just these few moments that we have together as a time to draw us to you, to show us the truth, to reveal your heart, your character, and your plan for our lives. Thank you for doing it in Jesus' name. Amen. We're in Luke chapter 8 today, and... um, We're going to look at the whole chapter. It's a long chapter, so strap in. Here we go. Soon afterward, he went on through cities and villages proclaiming and bringing the good news of the kingdom of God, and the twelve were with him, and also some women who had been healed of evil spirits and infirmities. Mary called Magdalene, from whom seven demons had gone out, and Joanna, the wife of Chusa, Herod's household manager, and Susanna, and many others who provided for them out of their means. When a great crowd was gathered, And people from town after town came to him. He said in a parable, a sower went out to sow his seed. And as he sowed, some fell along the path and was trampled underfoot. And the birds of the air devoured it. And some fell on the rock. And as it grew up, it withered away because it had no moisture. And some fell among thorns. And thorns grew up up with it and choked it. And some fell into good soil and grew and yielded a hundredfold. And he said these things he called, as he said these things, he called out, He who has ears to hear, let him hear. My message today is entitled, Jesus, the Word of God. I read to you initially, uh, before my prayer, from the book of John. John chapter 1, verses 1 through 5, and also chapter 14, where we understand that Jesus is the Word. So we have the Word of God, the Bible, and in John chapter 1, we come to understand that Jesus himself is the Word in the sense, the true and living Word. And so we have Jesus, the one who changes us, and we have the Word of God, the one that continues to change us after we've been eternally changed. It has to do with our salvation and our growth all mixed together. And so as we come to understand the Word of God, we we understand that we need that Word. First, we need Christ, the Word, but we also need the Bible, which is the Word. God has given us that. Uh, The two areas of my message today, first, we're going to look under the banner of hearing God's Word, And then second, we will look under believing God's word, hearing God's word first and then believing God's word. So under hearing God's word, in these first eight verses, we see that everyone is called to hear. So 
we'll know for certain in just a moment as we look at the explanation of this parable, but let me go ahead and, and do a little spoiler alert. The word is represented by the seed. And so as the seed is being sown, notice that it is not sown in any specific manner. It is sown in a, in a huge way. It is abundantly sown. Some of it falls on good soil. Some of it falls on bad soil. Some of it falls on the rocks. Some of it falls in the middle of the thorns. Some of it falls along the path. So we see that the seed, which is God's word, goes out to all. I think the understanding we have from that is that God would love for everyone to hear his word. Everyone is called to hear. Now, not everyone has heard. In fact, in our world, not even everyone has access to hear. Not all. And so God's given us a responsibility, those of us who are Christ followers, and have his word in our hearts and have his word because we have a relationship with him, but we're, we already did on the cross. We are called to go and make the gospel, the good news, the word of God accessible to all. We are not in control of how it is heard. We are in control to some extent that it is heard. Our daughter Victoria, one of our four, she's our third we, we call her our number one third child. They're all number one. You get it. She uh, lives in New York City. She's about to graduate from college. She's working right now for a, for a large nonprofit organization. She hopes to continue that after graduation. The name of the organization is Charity Water. And, and Charity Water has a kind of a real simple, clear purpose for their existence. It is that everyone on the planet who does who currently does not have access to clean water, would, sometime in the foreseeable future, have access to clean water. It's a simple purpose. But it's a huge task. Why? Well, because right now about 630 million people do not have access to clean water. That boggles our minds. Here we live in America, we just walk up and turn on the tap. And we drink. And it's good. Or, we just go buy bottled water everywhere or fancy water, or spring water, or spizzy water. I mean, we have more water than we know what to do with. I was working one time um, after one of the hurricanes giving out water to people whose power wasn't on and, you know, they needed water, they needed ice and some other things. And I look back of an 18-wheeler, and this car pulls up, and I walked up with the case of water, and the person in the car said, oh, no, I don't drink that kind. excuse me okay it's all we got you'll last for about three days but otherwise you're good you know so we don't have a concept of not having access to clean water their purpose very simply is to change that and to give access can't make them drink it but you can give them access to it as christians spiritually part of our call maybe even the largest part of our call, is to make the gospel accessible to everyone. We can't make them believe, but we can make it available. And it's God's heart and God's belief that everyone should hear that gospel. And then he does his work from there. Verse 9, And when his disciples asked him what this parable meant, he said, and I'm so glad this happened. This doesn't always happen in Scripture. So Jesus gives a parable. And often we're left to decipher the parable under the, hopefully the direction of the Spirit, an understanding of the context of the entire Word of God, understanding of the context of the situation in which he is speaking that word to say, this is what Jesus means. But this time we don't have to wonder. You don't have to listen to Eddie's interpretation of the sowing of the seed. You get to hear Jesus' explanation of the sowing of the seed. To you it has been given to know the secrets of the kingdom of God, but for others... They are in parables so that seeing they may not see and hearing they may not understand. Now the parable is this. The seed is the word of God. The ones along the path are those who have heard. Then the devil comes and takes away the word from their hearts so that they may not believe and be saved. The ones on the rock are those who when they hear the word, they receive it with joy, but these have no root. They believe for a while and in time of testing they fall away. And as for what fell among the thorns, 
they are those who hear, but as they go on their way, they are choked by the cares and the riches and the pleasures of life, and their fruit does not mature. As for that, in the good soil, they are those who, hearing the word, hold it fast in an honest and good heart and bear fruit with patience. So what we learn about simply hearing the word, it's not all that simple. What we learn is that hearing is spiritual warfare. Hearing is spiritual warfare because Satan doesn't want us to respond to the truth. So he distracts us. Sometimes he distracts us with difficult things, life challenges, disbelief, doubt, confusion, whatever it may be. Sometimes he distracts us with good things. I mean, we can be distracted from the best by something that is less than the best, but it's still pretty good. And, and so he, he does that because he does not want us to be a follower of the word and the truth. We can hear it, but not respond to it. So everyone is called to hear, and hearing is spiritual warfare. Verse 16, no one, after lighting a lamp, covers it with a jar, puts it under a bed, but puts it on a stand so that those who enter may see the light. For nothing is hidden that will not be made manifest, nor is anything secret that will not be known and come to light. Take care, then, how you hear, for to the one who has, more will be given, and from the one who has not, even what he thinks that he has, will be taken away. So what is he saying there? I believe what he's saying there is that hearing more yields more or produces more in the life of the hearer. So I've grown up in church. Some of you have as well. Some of you are new to this. So you wouldn't have the same story that I have. But from the time I was very little, I've always been around the Word of God at home and at church and in life. And now that I've been in ministry all these years, of course, I've handled the Word of God on a daily basis. I've prepared to teach it. I've considered it. I've, I've written ideas and thoughts about it. I've studied it intensely. I've read it devotionally. And yet, every single time I go to the Word of God, if I am honestly searching for God's truth, even if I've read that passage of Scripture countless times, I learn something new. It's amazing. I love the book of Philippians. If you know me and you've known me for a long time, you would recognize that I quote from Philippians often. I've probably memorized more Philippians than the other books. Philippians is a short book. Philippians is a fairly simple book, at least to me, and so maybe that's why I study it more. I've probably preached out of Philippians as much or more than any other place in the Bible. I'm aware that Paul, when he wrote under God's direction the letter to the church at Philippi, the book of Philippians, he wrote it from prison. It is known as a book of encouragement, though he wrote it from prison. And so as I consider that, when I'm reading, I think, okay, I know Paul's context. I'm reading these words about being encouraged and trusting and faith, etc. And yet, Paul was in prison when he wrote this. What in the world do I have to complain about? And so it's, it's just always been a source of encouragement for me. But, but I promise you, even though I know it pretty well, I've preached on it, read it, studied it, considered it, memorized portions of it. Every time I go to it, I learn something new. Every single time. Because the more we are hearing, feasting, studying, and reading God's Word, the more we learn and the more we grow. It's when we get to a place that we think, eh, I've read Philippians, I'm good. That's prideful. Oh, I've read John 3.16 a thousand times. For God so loved the world, he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believes in him is not perished, I have rather life. I know that. I'm good with that. No. This is the word of God. It is powerful. It is life-changing. And when we come to it that way, God honors our willing search. He honors our heartfelt desire to know it more deeply. The Apostle Paul, one of the greatest theologians of all time, he, among many other things, wrote arguably the greatest theological volume, the book of Romans. And in Romans, in trying to describe and, and help the Roman church understand the richness of God's heart and an understanding of theological direction that was pure and right and honorable and holy, we see his intelligence, we see his heart, we see his desire for theological truth. 
Or in the book of Philippians, because I know that one pretty well. He said about himself, not that I have already obtained it, but I press on in order that I may lay hold of that for which I was laid hold of in Christ Jesus. If Paul has to say, I'm not there yet, I'm pretty sure we have to say it too. And God honors that when we come humbly to his word and say, Lord, teach me. Lord, show me. Lord, reveal to me your truth. Hearing more yields more. Verse 19. Then his mother and his brothers came to him, but they could not reach him because of the crowd. And he was told, your mother and your brothers are standing outside desiring to see you. But he answered them, my mother and my brothers are those who hear the word of God and do it. It seems a little ostentatious that he's saying, hey, I don't want to talk to them right now. I don't think that's the point he's making. I believe the point he's making is this, that obedience changes loyalty. Obedience changes loyalty. It doesn't mean that he doesn't love his mom and his brothers, his family anymore. He does. But he's using this as a teaching opportunity to say, look, there is an opportunity for us to cling to the truth of God, and in so doing, our family dynamics, spiritually speaking, change. So all of us in this room who have a relationship with God through Jesus, we are, in essence, because we have the same dad, spiritually, brothers and sisters in Christ. Now, we're different. I mean, we joke. I joke with guys sometimes. We're like brothers from a different mother. I mean, you know, we're, we're different. We look different. We have different backgrounds. We, we have different interests and understandings. But we have the same spiritual connection through Christ. So we are brothers and sisters in Christ. Our obedience to Christ changes our loyalty. Another word you could say is it changes our priority. Let's use marriage as an example. Jesus uses his marriage, uses marriage a lot as an example about his relationship to his church. He even calls us the bride. We, the church, are the bride. He is the groom. Well, this picture of, of marriage is interesting. Through the years I've interacted with people who have said to me, I love my spouse more than anything or anyone. Now, they've shared that with me sometimes in a counseling setting. They've shared that with me sometimes in a situation where they are in a, at a breaking point in their marriage. Where someone has been abusive, or someone has been unfaithful, or someone has, has done something, or said something, or acted in some way. And it's not just a little bit, it's been usually over time, and there's kind of a chronic pattern. All of us say the wrong things sometimes. All of us do the wrong things sometimes. It's different when it's the general pattern of your life. And then to say, but I love them more than anyone. If we know those details, we back up from that simple statement and we go, we might not say it out loud, but what are we thinking? No, you don't. You abuse them emotionally, verbally, maybe even physically. You're unfaithful to them. And again, this is not a, a single episode. This may be years and years of this. But then to say, but I love them more than anyone or anything else. We would say, no, that's not true. It's the same with our, in our relationship with Christ. It's not a true statement for us to live in disobedience and dysfunction and apart from Christ, not worshiping with, his brothers, with our brothers and sisters in Christ, not, not studying God's word and coming to the truth of God's word, not making ourselves available to the teaching and the change and the heart of life that God wants to do in us, and then saying, but I love Jesus more than anything else in the world. That's not true. You're just saying that. You, don't, you either don't understand or you're dishonest. But when we are connected to Jesus, I mean really connected to him, and, and while not perfect, because none of us are that, but generally living in obedience to him, joyfully following his commands and his directives, recognizing that that kind of life brings joy, brings peace, brings hope. It doesn't remove us from struggle, but it brings those things in the midst of the struggle. Then we recognize, and by the way, others recognize, you do love Jesus. Because you've been through this terrible experience or this difficult situation, and yet you're still following. You're still faithful. You're still loving. Let's look at marriage for a moment. When people have to continually announce to others that they love, sometimes we question that. 
But let's take the couple that's been married for 30, 40, 50 years, and we know them pretty well. We see them in public when they don't see us. They don't know anybody's watching, and they're holding hands. And he steals a kiss from her just because he can. And at the restaurant, they're talking to each other and, and giggling like they're on their first date, though they've been doing this for most of their life. And we say, oh, they're acting like they just got married. Like they don't know how hard marriage is. Like they're unaware of the struggles of life. What do we say about them? They must really love each other. And they probably do. And if you interview them, they would say, oh, we do. Not without struggle. Not without challenge. Not without some hurdles through the years. But we love. I was in a retreat setting recently with some other pastors, and we didn't really know each other that well. And one pastor was sharing about the faithfulness of God to carry them through a very difficult circumstance when their child nearly died. And he said, in the hospital room, I prayed, Lord, deliver my child from this terrible illness and this terrible situation. I asked, because I know that you're the healer. And he said, you know, God answered that prayer, and my child was healed, and it reminded me that God is the great provider and the great healer. And we all said, yes, of course, thanks be to God. And then the man sitting across the table said, when our child was 13, we prayed that prayer, and God's answer was to take our child home. And he died. And we were reminded that God is the great provider and that God is the great healer. We just healed him in a different way. So, it's not the circumstance that gets to define who God is. God defines himself by his glory and by his greatness. But obedience changes our loyalty so that we're not focused on us and our situation. We're focused on the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords, and we trust him for that. Verse 22. One day he got into a boat with his disciples, and he said to them, Let's go across to the other side of the lake. So they set out, and as they sailed, he fell asleep. And a windstorm came down on the lake, and they were filling with water and were in danger. And they went and woke him, saying, Master, Master, we are perishing. I just think it's hilarious that he was sleeping through the storm. And he awoke, and he rebuked the wind and the raging waves, and they ceased, and there was calm. And he said to them, Where's your faith? And they were afraid, and they marveled, saying, No saying to one another, who then is this that he commands even winds and water, and they obey him? The thing we need to understand about the word of God is that it calms fear. The word of God calms fear. The Bible says that God is more than conqueror, so fear has no place when God is present. It doesn't mean that we're not ever going to be afraid. Of course we're going to be afraid. But when we're afraid, we have options, those of us who are in Christ. We can run toward him, or we can run away from him. The word calls us to run toward him, because there we will find him with open arms to calm the storm. And sometimes he allows the storm to continue to rage, but he holds us in the midst of it. That's okay, too. I feel safe there. Our daughter was born, our oldest was born, just a few weeks prior to Hurricane Andrew, we were living in the south part of Broward, not even in the eye of, of Miami-Dade, but in, in South Broward. And I remember that night, of course, all those kind of hurricanes hit in the middle of the night. I don't know why that is, but they always hit in the middle of the night. It's always scarier in the dark than it is in the light. And I remember we didn't have anything to board up the windows where we were. We now knew that this was a really, really, really bad storm. We heard trees breaking, limbs crashing. We heard this happening outside, and I'm holding this little tiny baby who's not even a month old yet, and she is completely and totally oblivious to the storm that is raging around her. I'm not. I was a little shaky. I'm walking around looking for ceilings to fall, you know, like I'm going to put my body over hers. I'm look The storm blew past. She was fine. She slept most of the night. You know, God can do the same thing for us in the midst of the storms of our lives. He can hold us in the midst of those storms. And whether we're aware of it or not aware of it, 
God is in control, and we can trust him with that. He is faithful. He brings peace, joy, hope, and faithfulness where there seems to be no opportunity for that to exist. Verse 26. Then they sailed to the country of the Gerasenes, which is opposite Galilee. When Jesus had stepped out on land, there met him a man from the city who had demons. And for a long time, he had worn no clothes, and, and he had not lived in a house, but among the tombs. When he saw Jesus, he cried out and fell down before him and said with a loud voice, What have you to do with me, Jesus, Son of the Most High God? I beg you, do not torment me. For he had commanded the unclean spirit to come out of the man. And many a time it had seized him. He was kept under guard and bound with chains and shackles. But he would break the bonds and be driven by the demon into the desert. Jesus then asked him, What's your name? And he said, Legion, for many demons had entered him. And they begged him not to command them to depart into the abyss. Now a large herd of pigs was feeding there on the hillside, and they begged him to let them enter these. So he gave them permission. Then the demons came out of the man, entered the pigs, and the herd rushed down the steep bank into the lake and drowned. The word of God gives freedom. Freedom came to this man simply by the word of God and the power of God into his life. God is more powerful. He rules through his written word, through his spoken word. He gives eternal freedom through the cross. That's how we come to know him. But then he gives daily freedom through his word. We need it. Every day we need it. We need to read it. We need to re be reminded of who we are in Christ. So the word of God gives freedom. Now, believing God's word. Not just hearing God's word, but believing God's word. Verse 10 to you it has been given to know the secrets of the kingdom of God, but for others they are in parables so that seeing they may not see and hearing they may not understand. There's no way for us to believe God's word without God because it seems counterintuitive, the things that are taught in this book. There's no belief without God. Faith, belief, it's a gift. It's a gift of grace. In Ephesians chapter 2, the Apostle Paul says, For by grace you have been saved through faith, not a work of yourself, so that you can't boast or brag or, or talk about what a great Bible expositor and understander you are. No, this is, a, this is a gift. This is grace that God gives. If you've come to know Christ, it is because God has already changed your heart with the gift of faith. So even our ability to know and understand God comes from God. Everything about salvation and a right relationship with God originates in God, not in us. What originates in us is sin, but what originates in God is grace. And so he, he comes with that gift because we recognize that we do not deserve what God gives us. But then also we, we come to understand that while we can't believe without God, we also come to understand that not believing is sin. Not believing is sin. In the storm, verse 25, he, he asked the disciples a very simple question. Where is your faith? He calms the storm and he says, where is your faith? He's questioning them about their connection to him. You say that you know who I am, but then a little storm comes up and, and your faith is rocked. And you're not sure. And you come running to me in great fear. Romans 10, 13 says that if we call upon God, he hears us and he saves those who call upon him. So we can, we can trust him, but not believing is sin. God does all of it. And then I think in verses 34 through 39, we see an encouragement to receive God's word. To receive God's word. Listen to this. When the herdsmen saw what had happened, they fled. And they told it in the city and in the country. And then people went out to see what had happened. And they came to Jesus and found the man, the formerly demon-possessed man. The demons had gone. And he was sitting at the feet of Jesus. He was clothed. And he was in his right mind. And they were afraid. Because they knew this guy. They had seen the craziness of his life. And those who had seen it told them how the demon-possessed man had been healed. Then all the people of the surrounding country, the Gerasenes, asked him to depart from them, for they were seized with great fear. So he got into the boat and returned. 
The man from whom the demons had gone begged that he might be with him, but Jesus sent him away, saying, Return to your home and declare how much God has done for you. And he went away, proclaiming throughout the whole city how much Jesus had done for him. So what we have here is is just an encouragement to receive God's word. Do not refuse or reject Jesus. If you don't yet know him, and you're here wondering, is this stuff true? I mean, do I really need to accept Jesus? I want to implore and plead with you that the answer to that question is yes. Yes, we all need Jesus. We all need what only Jesus can provide. We we don't deserve anything. Nothing. But by way of the cross, he, He gives us, by grace, what we don't deserve. He gives life, He gives forgiveness, and only He can can give that. You know who believed in Jesus in this story? The demons believed. They had more faith than the other herdsmen. They believed. Asked that He not send them into the abyss, but put them somewhere. Just put them in the pigs. Herdsmen didn't like it. Maybe it cut into their profit margin. I'm not really sure. But they didn't like him. They were afraid of him. They weren't sure what all this meant. And and I think our world often has that view of Jesus. But just know that the presence of Christ in your life makes all the difference in the world. And then last, a couple of stories of miracles. Now when Jesus returned, verse 40, when Jesus returned, the crowd welcomed him, for they were all waiting for him. And there came a man named Jairus, who was a ruler of the synagogue. And falling at Jesus' feet, he implored him to come to his house, for he had an only daughter, about 12 years of age, and she was dying. As Jesus went, the people pressed around him. And there was a woman who had had a discharge of blood for 12 years. And though she had spent all her living on physicians, she could not be healed by anyone. She came up behind him and touched the fringe of his garment, and immediately her discharge of blood ceased. And Jesus said, who was it that touched me? And when all denied it, Peter said, Master, the crowd surrounds you and are pressing in on you. I mean, how in the world could you know who touched you? But Jesus said, Someone touched me, for I I perceive that power has gone out from me. And when the woman saw that she was not hidden, she came trembling and falling down before him, declared in the presence of all the people why she had touched him and how she had been immediately healed. And he said to her, Daughter, your faith has made you well. Go in peace. And while he was still speaking, someone from the ruler's house came and said, Your daughter is dead. Do not trouble the teacher anymore. But Jesus, on hearing this, answered him, Do not fear, only believe, and she will be well. And when he came to the house, he allowed no one to enter with him except Peter, John, James, the father, and the mother of the child. And all were weeping and mourning for her. But he said, Do not weep, for she is not dead, but sleeping. And this next verse proves she was really dead. They laughed at him, knowing that she was dead. Taking her by the hand, he called, saying, Child, arise. And her spirit returned, and she got up at once, and he directed to someone that something should be given her to eat. And her parents were amazed, but he charged them to tell no one what had happened. We are called to have faith in God's word. Here's the thing. God can do for us what we can never do do for ourselves. God is a righteous, loving, holy, miracle-working God. Often when I pray with people who are in a desperate situation for whatever reason, I will say to them, and I will pray, Lord, we know that you do your absolute best in the most difficult circumstances, and this is one of them, whatever the circumstance may be. So we ask God that you do it now. Now sometimes God's answer is, yes, I'm going to do it now. Sometimes God's answer is, no, I'm not going to do that, but I am still doing something. Trust me in it anyway. But God is a miracle-working God. We are called to have faith in his word. This word, the Bible, this word, who is Jesus himself, is not just for some people in ancient history. It is for us today. Jesus said, I've come that you might have life and that you might have it more abundantly. And he meant now, not just in heaven. Some people say, well, it's terrible now, but it's going to be really good in heaven. It's terrible now and it is going to be really good in heaven. But it can be really good now too if we're trusting and following after God. 
He gives us taste of heaven all along the way. It's not the same and of the same substance as it will be in the future, but it's way better than it ought to be. I mean, everything that God gives is a gift. You recognize that, don't you? We deserve nothing. Do do this with me. Everyone take a deep breath together. Ready? (sighs) Gift of God right there. You don't deserve it. I don't deserve it. And we think that we do. We don't. But God gives anyway. When we approach God and his word with an understanding that we do not deserve, but he loves us and gives us that anyway. He gives us grace, meaning we get what we don't deserve, and he gives us mercy, meaning we don't get what we do deserve. That's all God and not us. And so I encourage you, come to the word of God and recognize that God is all that we need. You can try to do things in your own strength. The Old Testament says it this way. It appears to man what is right, but it only ends in death. God is the one who brings 